FAQ and a chance to win a prize. The ultrasound usually shows its size as more than 5 millimeters if it is causing pain. What am I talking about? Ureteric stone. Ureteric stone of more than 5 millimeters is the one that will cause pain. Less than 5 millimeters will usually pass out without causing pain, usually. So the, if the ultrasound, if there is pain, then ultrasound probably will show ureteric stone at least of 5 millimeters. That was your medical question and the prize goes to the, someone who answers this question. In 16 and 1665, What did Isaac Newton invent? Somebody there, back there, I first heard calculus. Yes, uh, Dr. Priyanka, take calculus. Calculus is the branch of mathematics that Isaac Newton invented in 1665. Well done. Okay, uh, I'll ask Dr. Tushar Mania to please come up on stage. Thank you, Tushar. Uh, Welcome all of you. Uh, as you know, we are running late and so the next talk on harmful, harmless and almost useless, almost useless and harmful will be postponed and we'll get on with the next talk. Before I proceed, uh, I must acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Mamta Manglani. She is an eminent pediatric hematologist, HOD of pediatrics at Cyan Hospital. She's now retired. And last but not the least, uh, founder person of uh, Bone Marrow Transplant Program at Cyan Hospital. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. We all, we are, we all are of course, uh, privileged to have Sir, Dr. Amdekar Sir here. And anyone who meets Sir first time usually has the feeling of awe because of his superhuman presence. Once you spend a little more time with him and get to know the human side, you want to strive to become something somewhere close to him. I'm not going to sit and uh, give you all the details of his achievements and all because that he himself would not like. And just with that, uh, I request sir to please come and take, take over the stage. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Tushar Shah, Tushar Maniar, for this opportunity. And I think uh, we are going to talk only about investigations, as I've been warned, not to talk about anything beyond that. He wasn't sure whether I would stop at that, so he warned me. Uh, however, I think it's very, very important that you have to have a basics with you before you think about testing. And I think I heard Tushar Shah talking about that you can just not ask for a test without knowing why you are asking for a test. And I think unless you have a clinical suspicion, don't ask for any test at all because they will simply confuse you. And finally, the report will end up saying, please correlate clinically. Now, every laboratory or a radiologist tells the clinician to do his business correctly. And therefore, I think uh, we, we need to be very sure that we have a clinical suspicion. And we well, don't think that everybody in India has a chance of developing TB. It's not common at all that much. Somebody who coughs is unlikely to have TB. There are far many more causes of cough as well and fever as well. And therefore, where do you have a clinical suspicion will come in a short time. But investigations have to be confirmative as often as possible. And only when they are not possible, you have at least a support chain. And TB is one where you can consider a confirmative test. At least you attempt a confirmatory test. For example, simple malaria, you have to have a confirmatory test. 
well, a clinical spectrum may be so wide that in some of the parts of the country, malaria comes even without fever. So forget about fever with rigors, etc. And same way, TB doesn't come with low-grade evening fever. It has nothing to do with sunset, that it suddenly starts coming. And therefore, any kind of fever is still TB. And therefore, we rather will have something to go by. Must try the confirmative test. And uh, the problem with TB is the test may confirm infection or disease. Now, this is true in varieties of disorders. For example, you have seen if you diagnose typhoid by a Vidal test, it may not be typhoid at all. In fact, when you go abroad and you miss the passport, you have lost the passport, you can do Vidal, ASLO, Manto test, and if all are positive, you are an Indian. You can convince the authorities, because who else can have all these? And without a disease. So that's called an infection. And infection simply means that you have had an opportunity to meet the germ, and therefore your body has reacted and has kept the memory on, so that if you miss the passport, that memory stands. Whereas the disease is one where the infection starts causing trouble to some of the organs in the body. That's a disease. And in TB, it is so important. Many of us have been infected, but most of us have not had the disease. And I think that's another point to do by. And I think, therefore, infection is simply an ex exposure to TB bacilli. Whereas the, when in this same infection gets onto some organ disturbance, you, you call it a disease. And I think this is very important to differentiate infection from disease, which we often meet in many other disorders, but we often forget. And I'm sure that if you look at an ASLO, for example, it's so often uh, ASLO is positive and you have to have somebody who says, uh, I have a knee joint pain and you can call it a rheumatic fever. Far from true. And therefore, again, uh, knowing that this is the way that we will really look at that. But what's the importance of knowing whether you have an infection but not a disease? Because you may be as susceptible to develop a disease. And there would be some subsets of population who are far more at risk to develop a disease. And if you are warned already, you could possibly take some preventive measures or at least pick up a very early diagnosis. And I think that is very important in TB. And we'll come to that very soon. Therefore, the question is, for whom should you be pushing off these tests for TB? I feel this is where a clinician comes in. And I want to again and again re-emphasize that do not do a test if you have not suspected a disease. When there is a theft, the police start their investigation from a site where the theft occurred, knowing fully that the thief is never waiting there for them to catch. But prob probably he has left behind some clue, and unless they pick up that clue, they will have to search all over the country and will fetch some thief who is probably not the one who has caused all this. And I think this is so important for all of us. Well, Indian Academy of Pediatrics has a very classical consensus statement, which holds true almost always. Forget the exceptions in medicine. I think we need to know the rules first. And most of them have not even understood the rules. So forget the exceptions. And I think exceptions are those who have mastered the rules. And even then, they must first put the rules. When I teach my adolescent how to cross the road, the rule is when it's green, cross the road. Unless he masters it, but he also must know when the signals are not working, don't wait for the green. He must know that as well. But very soon I see that he can cross the red as well. Now he has gone too far. So I think we will go by the rule. And this is a classical statement made. It is useful for the masses there would be always an exception. As I said again, if you follow this, you will be less often wrong. In medicine, you cannot be sure that you are always right. In fact, if you are always right, then only you have not understood how often you are wrong. That's the only thing. And therefore, this will help you to start suspecting and say, look, am I to investigate for TB? And I think once you do that, 
history of contact is very important in a small child. And what is a contact? Every one of us has a contact. You move in a crowd, one of the hundred will have a TB and you have a contact. What do we mean by contact in relevance to a clinical suspicion? Generally, an intrafamilial person who has had a disease within the last two years. The reason why within the last two years is there could be a varying time that this person has infected a child and there could be a varying time of incubation period as well. Therefore, to be on the safe side, you need to ask whether there has been somebody in the family who has had TB in the last two years. Whenever you ask for such a history, be sure that somebody has rightly diagnosed. Otherwise, it's very common for me to say, my doctor said you don't have TB, but it's better you take a treatment. Now, how is that? If you don't have TB, you don't take treatment. Or sometimes the doctor would say, you don't have TB, but I'm a little worried whether you have TB. Now, if you are worried and you can't make out, send it to somebody. So I think when you have a history of TB, be sure that somebody has rightly diagnosed. And if that is so, then take it as a contact, and especially under two years, and also in a malnourished child under five years, immunocompromised by many other ways, it's very important that this child has a risk of infection and also probably infection getting on to a disease. Having said that, you may have other immunocompromised states, like somebody is on steroids, somebody has an HIV. So these are the people for whom you should consider testing. Largely, in a symptomatic child, where I've said clinical suspicion, another set where you have a young child who has been in contact, and a third, a child in contact at any age who has an immunocompromised state. And I think these are the kinds of subsets in population where you consider a test for TB. Having said now for whom we want to test for TB, which test for TB? We are first talking about a disease. We'll t end up with talking about infection. Now, which test can be done for TB? Most often, the infection comes through the droplet, through the respiratory tract. So it could come by skin, by GI tract, and even from mother to a child, but largely through the respiratory tract. And therefore, a chest X-ray is a good test. For each test, we all must look at what is the sensitivity and specificity, which means if it's positive, how often it could be false positive. And if it's negative, how often it could be false negative? Well, there is no test in science generally which is 100% sensitivity and specificity both looked after. Because there could be always a laboratory error. If you have a bacteriology, there could be a contamination. There could be colonization. And therefore, there are always issues. But it's good enough for us to largely decide a test which is reasonably sensitive and reasonably specific. If the disease is very common in the community, we want more of a specificity so that we don't overdiagnose. And if the disease is not so common, we want much higher sensitivity so that we don't miss a disease. And I think to that extent, a chest x-ray has a place, especially in our routine practice, because confirmation, especially in Pediatric TB is not so easy. And therefore, a chest X-ray is a helpful test, but not a confirmative test, a mere supportive test. And what kind of a support? Yes, typically, uh, if you have a mediastinal lymph nodes, well, today, uh, over the last 50 years, as I see, uh, earlier when we were trained and in the initial period of my practice, a large lymph node on a chest X-ray was invariably TB. Now, a large lymph node on a chest X-ray is often not TB, is often lymphoma. What has happened over a time? Today's child is exposed to TB so early in life that he does not present with primary complex. He presents with something different because his body is already sensitized to this fellow. And therefore, his reactions pathologically reacting differently than a very virgin exposure to TB who came with a lymph node. Today, if I see a big lymph node, I'm worried about lymphoma more than TB. And therefore, you need to look at how the epidemiology of all these infections keep on changing. 
And I think that's another way for every disease. And to that extent, just because merely you saw something of that kind, but even then, a healthy child who comes with an acute onset of a pleural effusion is invariably a tuberculous effusion. And the reason why I'm barking on this is that time and again, I see a child who comes back from school and gets high fever, and in the next day he's breathless, and you diagnose pleural effusion, you will get a neutrophilic leukocytosis, not only in the blood, but also in the fluid. And you wrongly consider it as a bacterial infection. You have missed a simple point that no bacterial infection develops an empyema in just 12 hours. Something that is developing so fast is never an infection. It's maybe an immune-mediated response to an infection or otherwise. And this is a very common mistake that one sees at all levels. And the children are being treated with antibiotics, drainage, and they will never get well, but a mere history taking that a whole fluid accumulated within 12 hours tells you that this is anything but infection and this is an allergic response in our country, commonly allergic to a dormant mycobacteria that you're already holding. And I think therefore an acute pleural effusion, a chronic cavitatory lesion, for example, in our country is still very likely TB and also the miliary shadows scattered all over the chest are very likely, though there could be many other differential diagnoses. We just heard about the horse and the mules and the zebra, but let me first master the horse and keep in mind the zebra, um, yes, but the mule more often than a zebra. And I think to that extent, miliary shadows and acute pleural effusion large enough, coming very quickly, a chronic fibrocaceous cavitatory lesions invariably are due to TB in our condition, but they are merely supportive. Then in case of doubtful lesion on a chest x-ray, do a lateral or a decubitus, but don't do a CT scan. CT scan in chest, at least in pediatrics, is almost not required. And chest x-ray can give all the information. Well, there are exceptions. And the exceptions are also not very easy to go by because the CT scan may pick up at the most a caseation. But I've seen radiologists. After all, what are radiologists? They are imagining people. It's called images. That means they imagine. Yeah, and we believe them. Oh, they are also imagining. And invariably, they don't have any knowledge about the history at all. Because you just say, oh, photo nikalo. Now they are photographers. So they have... They have no knowledge of what the patient has or they have no knowledge from a physician what they should look for. And therefore, they see whatever it is. In one of the radiology conference, I was asked to talk about a clinician's view of a radiologist. I was happy that I was not beaten up and I came home safe because I told them that, look, you don't try to diagnose. You only see, tell us what you see and we will diagnose. So he said, why is that? I said, if I show you from a window an image across the road in the middle of the night, which is standing on two, I will decide whether it's a dog standing on two or a human being. You just say he has two legs. Okay. Now, he tries to say it's a human being. On the other hand, if the human being is kneeling on hands, he calls it a dog because it's on four. I said, you just say two or four. Now, don't go further and say, a shadow is on two, so human being looks in a suit. There are many in the suits today. So, uh, so therefore, must be gentlemen. No, no, no. Those who have no suits are not criminals. So, the point is, you just say he is in a suit. And if he is in the middle of the night, don't call him a beggar or something or a criminal. He may be genuinely going out for some work. So, this is a limitation of all that. And I have seen caseation reported by CT scan people. When you take out a lymph node, there is not even a semblance of caseation. So don't believe them too much. Better don't ask. And therefore, a chest x-ray is good enough. All clinicians must know how to read a chest x-ray because they write. And most of the clinicians don't give a report. A chest x-ray fellow gives the type report. And whatever comes as type report looks genuine. 
So we also must start writing our reports. They are equally felt genuine, whether they are or not. And I think that's where probably a radiology will put that. But don't forget about histopathology also. That's also supportive. You see a typical a tuberculoid response pathologically. There is a lymphocytosis. There is the caseation in the center with epithelial cells and giant cells. A typical a reaction histopathologically, but which could be mimicked even by a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, the histopathologist is not going to call it TB. He may say, out of 100 times when I see such a picture, 90 times it's TB, but 10 times it may not TB. So these are all supportive. But in pediatric practice, you need to have a supportive often if you fail to confirm. However, you must try to confirm. And don't forget, when you get a lymph node biopsy, send it for bacteriology. Send it for a confirmation test. A lymph node biopsy specimen is a good specimen to send for a bacteriology and therefore just not for histopathology. Generally, a biopsy means histopathologist, but no, it's also a confirmative test can be done. Having said that, these are the tests which are only supportive. And surely we need to depend on them as well. Uh, we have the test for TB, and I think we need to look at the correct sample that we, we possibly get. Uh, we get a sputum. That's the best sample. In a child, you don't get a sputum. In a child, it's a possibacillary disease, which means there are far, far few bacilli. And if there are far few bacilli, then you might easily miss them. Besides, you don't get a correct sputum coming from a lower airway. You often just get a saliva spitted out. And I think, therefore, you could have an induced sputum. You can give a 3% sodium chloride uh, inhalation and then uh, try to see whether you get a better. You make them cough. Uh, it's not possible, again, in a small child. And therefore, you look at a gastric aspirate. Gastric aspirate is a good sample to go by in pediatric practice. Quite a few times when your laboratory is well charged to look for it and conscientiously trying to look for it, there are studies to demonstrate 30-40% of a, even a primary complex in a small infant can pick up a bacteria through a gastric aspirate. It's worth trying and it's so simple to try a gastric aspirate. A bronchial well lavage is very invasive and is not superior to gastric aspirate. And therefore, we don't do any invasive tests at all. And I think that's another point I wish to make, that whenever you consider a test, please consider two things. Is it very invasive and painful to a child? And second is, what's the cost of the test? And unless you have a cost-benefit ratio, the pain-benefit ratio, don't jump to do a test. It's not a good clinician who does 100 tests and then pats his back to pick up a rare disease. For that, picking up a rare disease, he has made blunders in many other patients unnecessarily. That's not a good clinician. And I think the good clinician has an audit to say how often I order a test that helps me. The help could be to rule out strongly. That's also help, but not rule out everything, and therefore you have that. I know ruling out reminds me that when I showed a cow to an intern, and I said, what's this animal? He said, it's cow. I showed it to an MD. He said, looks like cow, but you must test and be sure, because he's an evidence-based fellow. Therefore, we must also know when not to test. We are discussing when to test, but of course, when not to test and which test you should not do. But when I showed to a DM who is highly qualified, he knows so much. So he said, this could be many. I said, what? He should be, it could be atrophied elephant. I said, how can a cow look like atrophied elephant? He said, no, there is one report in Lancet. I'm impressed. What else? Hypertrophied goats. Again, finally, I said, what about cow? He said, if everything is ruled out, then I will consider cow. So the point is, we don't want to be super specialists. First thing, we are not. OK. And a good super specialist might be a good generalist first. OK. So I would ask my super specialist, are you a good generalist? Today, I'm sure in adult medicine, if you have an undiagnosed disease, whom do you go to? Tushar is there, but how many Tushars? Okay, but if you have a cardiac problem, oh, so many cardiologists. 
every lane, every building. So the problem is that you want to really do the best. Sometimes you can pick up many other tissue fluids, but as you get on to other tissue fluids, your chance of getting a bacteriological result is getting less and less, and therefore in TB meningitis or CSF, in a tuberculous pleural effusion, a pleural fluid, not a very strong bed because many of them have allergic reaction more than an infective itself. And then, of course, you could consider various tests, like a smear, like an MGIT, which is a classical bacteriological test and a gold standard. And today we have a Bactic, which can give you a quick result. And then, of course, a molecular test, a gene expert. And that is a CBNAT, which is cartridge-based, the nucleic acid amplification test. That's what gene expert we talk about. Having said this now, the collection of sample becomes important. And how do you collect the sample? I've said you can try. When you get a gastric aspirate, you want at least about 10 ml to get if you don't have that much. Generally done on a fasting in the morning. The whole idea is that largely a child will swallow the sputum and he will not be able to expectorate and th throw it out. So he generally swallows the sputum overnight and therefore in a stomach you will have possibly those bacteria in that swallowed sputum. That's the hypothesis. And then you pick up a sample uh, maybe on two consecutive days. It has been shown that if you do on the test on two consecutive mornings, your chance of getting a bacteria is much higher. And if you do it three or four times, it does not increase much more yield. So the standard now recommendation is do it on two consecutive mornings and hope for the best. Well, you will not necessarily get a bacteria, as I said, you will get it only 30-40% in a child who has got an early diagnosis, uh, early disease. But if it's a chronic fibrocastus cavitated disease, you will 100% get a thing because you can pour out a sputum as well. And I think that is the way to go by. Bile is invasive, as I said, and the biopsy material and the rest of the fluid that you collect, you do send for that. Having said that, let's look at what do we know about the tests. We know that we can do these tests, but what are the limitations of these tests? What are the sensitivity and specificity of these tests? Well, the direct smear is often po not possible in a possibility disease because we have a child whose number of bacilli in that sputum are very small besides the problem of getting a good sample. But even if you get a good sample, unlike an adult, where is generally a, a polybacillary disease, a child has a very possibacillary disease, and therefore you may not pick up. Plus, you may pick up any other mycobacteria also. After all, it's just an acid first bacillus, and therefore you may not be sure whether it's a classical mycobacterial TB. It could be a typical mycobacteria as well. And to that extent, smear is a good idea, but not much of use in pediatric practice, and therefore people have tried uh, process samples like you could have some chemicals added to it, which probably increases the yield of a bacterial getting into the sample. And I think you could possibly have a little increased yield with all such processing of a sample. Even then, there is a much lesser chance of your meeting. And then, of course, you could have a classical bacterial gold standard diagnosis. A point here is that today is an era where we are seeing a lot of resistant strains for varieties of reasons. And I think it's very, very important that we not only confirm the diagnosis as often as possible, but we also try to get a bacteriological drug sensitivity because for all practical purposes, you will come to know that you are treating a drug resistant TB only after three months. In the first three months, majority of the drug resistant TB children are also improving, simply because you are giving four drugs to begin with, and maybe not all four drugs he is resistant to. And even if he has a one or two drugs acting, he seems to be getting a little better, and then he comes back in vengeance at the end of two or three months, and you are likely to be misled to say that, look, you're improving, so your drugs were working. No, it was a very partial improvement, not sustained, and a classical drug resistance uh, is 
moving that way, it, it gives you a false sense of security that you are getting onto a right path and then he suddenly gets into vengeance. In TB, it's much more complicated because uh, even when you have a drug-sensitive TB, believe me, you are not sure whether the child will respond. And it's a frightening situation today. Today, every disease, even if you diagnose correctly and you have the right answer, the right drugs, a compliant patient, one is not very sure whether one will come out successfully. And I think this is what we all should keep in mind. And you have a very simple example to talk to your patients unless you counsel them to begin with. Today, if I see a child of TB, correctly diagnosed, drug sensitive, I tell them mostly your child will get well, but not always. And they say, why? The other day at Wadiya, the whole crowd came shouting in ICU, why is the child not getting well? My ICU people called me to counsel them. I said, is one of you a teacher? Luckily for me, one person says, yes, I'm a teacher. I said, you teach, right? Yes. Does every student of yours score well? He said, no, no. I said, that means you have failed. He said, no, I have not failed. They have failed. I said, that's the point. The doctor has not failed, but the patient has failed. But most of the children in your class pass. But few fail. Most of my children patients do well, but few fail. Few fail not because my drugs failed or I failed, because he could not push up his own immune system to help the drugs. <clears throat> I asked him, how do you write? He said, I write with a pen. I said, give this pen in the hand of a newborn. He's not writing. He said, no, but I said, he has a hand also. He said, no, he has not learned. Now, I gave it to a hand in the hand of a child who has learned, but who refuses to write. I said, now why is he not writing? So finally, you write through your brain, willingness to use the brain. You must have a hand and you must have a pencil, but the pencil and hand are so insignificant, people have written through the toes also, if you don't have the fingers. But still you say, write with a pen. Pen does not write. Handwriting, hand doesn't write. Brain writes and you should have a willingness to use the brain. Today I say, what are the indications of CT scan? CT scan is there every corner of the city. Indication to me of CT scan of the brain are only three. You must have a patient who has a brain. Obviously, everyone has. Okay. Second is, you must have a CT scan. That's also there. What's the third indication? You must have a physician who does not use his brain. So, I, I feel that that is not the way we are going to go by. And I think... The point I'm making is that, yes, today because of this uncertainty, medicine is a science of uncertainty, and a lot depends on how my patient responds to my treatment. Even my treatment is right, my diagnosis is right. We believe majority will do, but a minority will not. And we can pick up those minorities, luckily at times, but at some other time he looks as good as you and me, and even then he does not. And in TB in particularly, and I'm sure it's all diseases, it's the same, that immunology is so different that sometimes if you are very strongly immune also, you can kill yourself. So point I'm making is, it's most important that you diagnose correctly as much as possible, and these tests are uh, very likely, must be tried. Gene expert, of course. Now, when gene expert came, we said that now we have a final answer. Soon we realized that gene expert can be negative even in TB. And therefore now people feel that if you have a strong suspicion and your gene expert is negative, you try MGIT. And if your MGIT is negative, you try gene expert. And I've had patients where unless both were done, we could not diagnose the disease correctly. So to that extent, the message is you try to confirm the diagnosis as often as possible. However, it may not be possible, but don't say that often it is not possible, so I won't try. Every one of us have tried to study, hoping that we will pass. But suppose even after study you fail, next time you don't try to attempt without studying, hoping that that may work. So 
you will have to put up your efforts and I think the message is you must try this. Today is possible. There are many agencies in the city who can offer these tests at a very cheap rate. The government is trying to push and make these tests available at a very subsidized rate. And I think we should be fully aware that this is very, very important. A combination has a higher sensitivity and specificity, and I've already said that. What about the other routine tests? There is nothing like routine. Many times my, clinic, my residents tell me, uh, we have done routine tests. I said, do I said this routine? There is no routine test in clinical medicine. And the, all these so-called routine tests are useless. CBC, complete blood count, give you totally incomplete interpretation. Okay. Neutrophilic leukocytosis is seen in 30% of tuberculosis patients. But there are people who say, polymorphs have gone up, so antibiotic. No, the polymorphs are like the ordinary, ordinary police with a stick. He is there all the time. He is there for nothing. He is there for everything. When there is a theft, he is there. When there is a Bollywood fellow coming there. When there is a minister, he is there. When there is a fire, he is there. What does he tell me? Anyway, he doesn't do anything finally. So, uh, don't look at polis. And when polis increase, the lymphos go down. When the polis go down, the lymphos go up. Both are non-specific fellows. Eosinophils may be specific. Platelets may be specific. And to that extent, don't go by CBC at all. In fact, don't do CBC. I don't know why we do ESR and CRP at all, just to convince somebody that you are sick. Well, he knows before he came to you. Uh, he wants to know what is sickness. And ESR, CRP don't give that. When I, I learned my medicine, there was no CRP. Then CRP came. I was impressed. And I thought that it was a sophisticated ESR, for which you pay more and you understand less. And then I was told, CRP comes up very fast. ESR takes time. So I thought that's a good idea. By the time I learned what CRP was, they said there is a precalcitonin. I said, now what is this procalcitonin? Sir, it comes even faster. In four hours it comes. Very soon there will be a test which will say, infection is at your door, close the door. So I don't believe in them at all. Okay, and what are all those? Those are body's reactions. Body should react to show them. If CRP is high, you are happy. I told you you have an infection. If CRP is low, you said you have an infection, but CRP may not be high. That means you have decided it's an infection. CRP helps you to defend or defend even otherwise. I don't know when to do CRP. I literally don't do CRP at all. But in my hospital, everyone has CRP. I know they are able to mount some CRP. I don't know what it means. People tell me, if it's very high, it's likely to be bacterial infection. I said, that I knew long back, even without having a high. Because likely means what? Also unlikely. So don't believe to say mostly. Mostly means mostly not as well. So don't do that. And then a cell count biochemistry in the fluids. Today we know that when you get an acidic fluid, you do what is known as SAG. Serum acidic albumin gradient. You don't look at those cells and proteins and all. Gone are the days. And therefore, don't do all that. You are wasting your money. And then some of them do routine LFT. I don't think in children you need it. Adults maybe, because adults are alcoholic, adults are obese, adults keep on doing many wrong things. Why are we calling adults? Simply because we are adulterated over childhood. So we are adults. So we, that's different. My children are not adults. They are still innocents. Their livers are mostly all right. I don't do a liver function test at all. And I know that if they have a silent liver disease, it could cause trouble. They may have hepatitis B, etc. But routine tests have no meaning. And I think to that extent, if HGPT goes up, HGPT is another useless test. I feel everybody who gets fever, even before getting fever, he does HGPT. I don't know what he makes out of that HGPT. And therefore, to me, uh, I don't need a liver function test. Antibody test, they are, they are banned. They are banned. Finally, they are banned in India also, but still they are available. Whatever is banned in India is easily available. So, uh, so to that extent, I think none of these tests are of any importance whatsoever. Then lastly, a MANTU test. 
Now today we know that a Mantu test is not a test to diagnose TB. A Mantu test is to diagnose that you are possibly infected. And Mantu test is a very difficult test. It has to be given intradermally, in the skin, not below the skin. Can you imagine you can push something in the skin? It's beyond imagination. You have an epidermis, dermis, and somewhere in between, what kind of needle you use? What kind of expertise you want? And therefore, unless somebody is doing it for donkey's years, just a man to test. As a technician, he only can do a test correctly. But you have any pathologist doing once in a while, he injects it subcutaneously, intramuscularly, or inside the bone, and then whatever the reaction, they measure. They measure with what? They measure with a foot rule? No, they measure with a tape which has been old, which has been stretched. So five millimeters have already become 10. And you are told that 10 is important. So don't write nine, write 10. Moment is 10, oh 10 is important. So you can see how difficult it is. And then what solution? One to you, five to you, 10 to you, 100 to you. It all depends on how much positive you want. More positive you want, push 100 to you. Everybody will be positive. And therefore, it has to be one or two to you, given intradermally, measured correctly. Okay, so many problems. Invariably, none of us can do it. Only that technician who has been doing it for years can do it. And how many such technicians? And therefore, today, man to test has lost its importance totally. Well, if you do it by any wrong means, and even then it's negative, oh, probably it's useful. Because you push 100 to you and fellow is not reacting. So they're reasonably good. So negative tests may have a better value. And therefore today Mantu is not done for diagnosis. But yes, Mantu could be done to be sure whether you are ever infected or not. And negative Mantu may push you a little against TB. But be sure, a Mantu is also body's response. There are several children for varieties of reasons may not react. And especially when you have got a very high, uh, severe form of TB. There are so many antigens there. A body's immune system is busy fighting. When you inject a little one TU or two TU, the body's lymphocytes say, I have no time to look at you. Negative test. You can imagine if there was a bomb blast and entire police force is busy with that and you go to a police station and say, somebody picked up my pocket. He said, not today. We have no time today. So if the immune system is busy fighting a major disease, that Mantu will be negative even when you have a severe disease. So Mantu has got a lot of problem. And then came the IGRA, interferon gamma release. Again, like ESR and CRP, this is a Mantu test only, done on a blood. Why, what's the advantage? Oh, for Mantu, you have to come back after two, three days again. Here, you can go only once. And you can go only once and get confused. Otherwise, you have to go three times and get confused. So choice is yours. So these are given up tests. Okay, don't do interferon gamma release tests at all. They are not recommended. At the best, they may show infection. And therefore, the last slide, uh, what is the test for infection? Yes, Mantro test is a test for infection. Whom do you test for infection? Now, suppose in a family, you have an a adult who has got an open TB, and you have a two-year-old and a five-year-old children. First thing I want to know clinically how they are, whether they have some symptoms, they have lost weight, they have lost appetite, yes, they are all fine. I would certainly do a chest x-ray to be sure that they are not harboring any lesion silently. And then I would do a Mantu test. If a Mantu test is negative, very likely, not 100%, they have not been infected. But they could be in an incubation period. So you still watch them for a while, for next six weeks to 12 weeks, if they remain well, I would say that they have never been infected. But suppose they are already man to positive. That means they are already infected. If they are infected, then I start looking at what is the risk of their infection getting into disease. And I think that's where you certainly want to pick up that and look at that. At risk, a symptomatic child. This morning, Tushar Shah was talking about a symptomatic child under test. Here is an asymptomatic child. And why have you tested? Because there is a contact. So you are justified in testing. And once you got a man to positive, then you look at, he's very healthy, but he's still under two years. 
he has got a very high chance of getting a disease very soon. There are studies to demonstrate that under one year, the chance is as much as 50-60%. That's very high. Under two years, it is still high, 20-30%. We don't want to take a chance. We would rather treat this child. Treat this child as a disease, wrongly, for good 60-70% of the time. But if we are delayed, so this child will spread the disease everywhere and may be finally coming with a tuberculous meningitis or disseminated TB. So the whole issue in medicine is to evaluate a risk. And if the risk exists considerably, you act. If the risk is low, you get him beyond five years, the risk is almost 2%. That means 98% of infected children at that age will not develop a disease. 2% may. Therefore, you watch them, but don't treat all 100 unnecessarily. And I think this is how a risk-benefit ratio goes on. And we will have to decide uh, what is the risk. Man to positive does not mean a disease, and man to negative does not rule. Case for TB infection, yes, I've already said uh, man to, and I'll just summarize. Do not test for TB unless there is a specific reason. And please write down why you tested. And I think the biggest problem with us, we have a lot of intelligence. We have a lot of experience. Today, you and me see in one year a number of patients that a Westerner sees in his whole lifetime. We have 50 times more experience. And I'm sure we have even a higher intelligence. And still we have poor performance. What's wrong? What is wrong is we have failed to document. Unless you document, you don't know whether you went wrong. Otherwise, you are always right. And I think learn to document why you are testing. Learn to document how you interpret and then only write a prescription. Your prescription should not be a name of the patient and name of the drugs. There has to be something in between. For TB, it's very, very important. And therefore, we try to confirm the diagnosis as often as possible. Yes, you have a, a subset of children who are bacteriologically negative but radiologically positive. Yes, you put down on your document that confirmative tests have failed. However, there is a strong clinical suspicion and a radiological support. Therefore, it's a radiological positive bacteriological negative TB. That happens. I remember years ago, one of the masters in pediatric TB who has written books on that had visited JJ and we showed him children who had man to negative and he said, no, no, why are you calling them TB? We said, come on the postmortem table, full of TB. So to that extent, we just don't want to go by only a test. We want to go also by a thing. Always document justification. And I think if you document justification, you may be wrong, but you will know that you were wrong and you can correct. But if you don't document, you will never know in life. There are many, many people who just don't document anything and be sure a legal problems come up because you don't document. If you document and you are wrong, a legality does not trouble you because a legality wants to know whether you are negligent and reasonably not ignorant. Okay, but documentation is the only way and I think uh, we have to differentiate between infection and disease. I hope from today, don't put anybody on anti-TB drugs just because some test is positive. Clinical suspicion, trying to confirm if not support, and finally document. If you do that in every disease, I'm sure you are less likely to be wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm, I really hope that uh, not only the points from TB, on TB, but sir's uh, simile on various conditions as well as on counseling. We all really look up to him and use the similes and counseling points that we learn from him all the time in our clinic. Dr. Snell, please, sir, please accept a small token. Some more things for you to read. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and not pediatrics, sir. Every, every time I come <laughs> here, both Tushars keep me abreast to say, sir, you have not read enough as yet. Please go back and come. And we'll test you next time. Thank you very sir, much for that. Thank you, sir. Let me just make it clear that none of them contain any pediatric material. 
Sir doesn't need any of that. He has given, it up, given me up on pediatrics. He said, try <laughs> something else. So. And so you also learn that you can never win an argument with sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs>